Cool. So, um, hi everyone, and welcome to the data classification with machine learning talk. Uh, first of all, um, who I am? Uh, I'm Mircea Dogaru. I'm one of the senior developers with the governors, and I am passionate about machine learning. And no, I did not study it in uni because I did something completely different. <laughs> Um, okay, the agenda for today, uh, we're going to cover what is data classification in the context of machine learning, we're going to go through the classification types that are available, then we're going to jump straight into ML.NET with a demo uh, where we're going to train a machine learning model, we're also going to have a SQL data catalog demo, and uh, we're going to go through some of the challenges uh, of uh, using machine learning, and well, we're going to have questions at the end, but we're gonna we're also gonna have questions between sections. So feel free to pop them into the chat or you know shout out when uh, when we get there. I'll let you know. Right. So what is data classification? Well um, classification in the context of machine learning is a task that applies labels to pieces of data, which can be text, images, videos using a machine learning model. Uh, a machine learning model is built from examples of classifications by using a specific algorithm. Uh, the process is called training, while the example classifications used to train the model are commonly named data sets. So how does this work? Um, well, you can see here an example of a data set. Um, you define a set of features to be extracted from, from, the, from the data, which can be like number of vowels or length of words, nouns, and then you pass them as inputs to a algorithm. The algorithm identifies patterns in the input data, and then it outputs those patterns as a model, which can then be used for predictions. Uh, a good example of classifications is as we can see here in the in in the slide is trying to identify whether a tweet is a positive or has a positive or a negative meaning uh, this specific uh, problem is called sentiment analysis and it is achieved through a, a classification called binary classification this means that there are only two labels or two classes Though it's best to think of it as asking a question which can only have a yes or no answer. In our case, is the tweet or message positive? Now, there are two main types of uh, data classification. Uh, we have uh, binary classification, uh, where we as, we, as we already saw, you can we can ask a question which has two answers. And then the second type is a multi-class classification. In this case, you have multiple labels uh, and you are trying to identify to which label or to which class this piece of information belongs to. Um, one example, which we'll cover in detail soon enough, is uh, identifying the information type of a string, whether it's a first name, a last name, phone number, or email address. To train such a model, the data set must contain examples of uh, of each class. Um, I guess, interesting enough, while there are dedicated multi-class algorithms, uh, multi-class classification can also be achieved by using combining multiple binary models, where you can ask, for example, a yes, no question for each class, like, uh, is this a phone number? Yes, no. Is this a first name? Yes, no. Um, and then aggregating the results and picking the one with the highest confidence or grouping them in classes by two, like, for example, is this a phone number or a first name? Uh, stuff like that. Right. Uh, any questions so far? Cool. We'll move on. Uh, OK, enough theory. Uh, how do we actually achieve? How do we actually do data classification? Well, it used to be and it still is in some cases like this, uh, you needed to know Python, uh, you needed TensorFlow, Keras, which are machine learning frameworks that on, can only be used in Python, more or less. And then you need to write a lot of code uh, to load, uh, load the training and validation data to define the features to be extracted and then, well, train and validate the model, everything done in code. Well, now it's much easier because we have ML.NET. So 
what is ML.NET. Uh, it's Microsoft's open source cross-platform machine learning framework. It provides tool to create, to train and consume machine learning models. And it also comes with a very solid wizard integrating into Visual Studio, allowing users to train a machine learning model just by providing a data set and clicking a few buttons. Um, the model builder supports um, a number of scenarios. Uh, some of them can actually train models and then consume them. And for some of these scenarios, there's no training mechanisms available yet, but uh, it supports loading models trained by Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch or any of the major um, machine learning frameworks available. Okay, um, let's train a model in ML.NET, shall we? Uh, okay, now um, training a model always starts with a data set. And we have our data set here. Um, as you can see, we have the data and we have the label or the class that that data belongs to. And we have some first names here. We've got a mix of male and female first names, uh, some email addresses that I generated from some generator I found on the web. And we have national insurance numbers as they look uh, in the UK. Okay, uh, in the next step, um, we're just gonna fire up Visual Studio, create a new project, start with a console application with .NET Core. Next, name is not important. Next, current and create. We're gonna wait for a bit as the project is created. Okay, so we're in Visual Studio. Uh, adding, adding a machine learning, well, uh, to start training, we simply go and add machine learning. And this is gonna fire up the wizard. These are the scenarios I was, I was talking to you about. Uh, these are the scenarios that support training. We've got text classification, value predictions, image classifications, some recommendations and object detection, and some limited scenarios like forecasting and clustering where, which you can't, you can't really train them, but you can load predefined models or pre-trained models in other frameworks. For us, we're gonna need text classification and we choose the local environment. Next setup. This is the point where we load up our uh, training data. I'm gonna close this so it doesn't complain. And let's load up data set CSV. It's gonna generate a preview of the data. We need to choose the, the column to predict, but it didn't understand that I already have headers. So we go to advanced options, data formatting, and we say that our file has headers. And now that we save, it's gonna pick up the headers. Uh, we want to predict the label. And then in the advanced options, the data is a text. Now there are several types of, uh, I mean, types of data that you can define. And this uh, influences what, um, what the model builder will do with the data. If you tell it text, it's gonna automatically extract features from a text. While if you give it a categorical data, which can be a, a set number of values that you know already, it's gonna behave differently because it doesn't need to extract features from that. Okay, so we have a text. We move to the next step. We tell it how long it, it should train. We're gonna train it for 60 seconds. This varies depending on how large the data set is. Uh, and also multiple iterations over the same model will improve the, the quality of the model up to a certain point because you start getting diminishing returns. Uh, so we're gonna start training and we're gonna wait for uh, the model builder to train. Now, what this does is that um, ML.NET's model builder currently supports multiple uh, trainers. Each trainer uses a different algorithm. So what it tries to do is it splits the data set into um, a training set and a validation set. 
So it picks some of those uh, points for some data uh, and it puts them aside and then it starts training on the bulk of the data set. Once the training is complete for each of these algorithms, it uses the validation set that it kept to see how accurate the model is in predicting for each, uh, for each of the labels. And then it does that for, for each algorithm and then it returns the one that brings the, the highest uh, accuracy. Um, and you, you can see here that we have micro accuracy and macro accuracy. Um, the, the way this works is in micro accuracy, uh, it takes um, a fraction of the instances predicted correctly versus the total number of, uh, of predictions. And that's basically the micro accuracy. While at the macro accuracy, it takes this fraction of instances predicted correctly for each label, and then it does the average between all of them. Anyway, needless to say is that for our multi-class uh, classification, micro accuracy is the most important. And it that's the one that's going to use to pick the best model. So it picked up the, the SGDA calibrated OVA, and then we just go to the next step. And now we can see how good it is. Now, James was already in the data set and it was probably used for validation. So we know that James is a first name, but let's try with a name that wasn't part of the data set, like my name, for example, Merchant. Predict, it is a first name with quite a high confidence. And if we try something like Mercha at redgate.com, that is an email address. Okay. So this is how uh, you train a model. Now in the next step, we just add it to the solution and it has already created some, uh, some uh, projects for us and added some code. If we look in the consume model here, we get all the code that we need to create a prediction engine and with a static method to predict where it gets an input, which the input is just the data. You need to specify just the data, not the label. And then it outputs the output, which is a prediction with a list of scores. Uh, and also in the, it also adds another console app uh, in the project and this is really cool because it actually shows you how it trained the model. So you have all the code here that was um, used to, to generate the, the best model, the best of the models. So it's really cool because you can then retrain using just this uh, algorithm and not, uh, not go through all the algorithms, uh, algorithms again and wait for them to, to do their thing. Okay, any questions so far? No, all good. Cool. There are a couple in the chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, my chat window go away. Yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> so is there a built-in mechanism to keep track of false positives so the model can be recalibrated as new data points come in? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. So you kind of need to retrain it with new data points in, and keep the old data set around as well. So, so you just add them to the data set and then retrain the whole model again. So other than data, data classification, how else do you think Redgate can use machine learning? Mm, that's a very good question. I guess it depends on each product. Uh, and it would be great for everyone after they see this presentation and how it works to look at their products and see if they can identify any other opportunities for, uh, for using machine learning. And okay, and are, are there any recommendations for avoiding biases in the data set? Um, for biasing, um, 
the best way is to use a balanced data set. So it, like you, you can see here in my data set that you can have, uh, I closed it. Anyway, uh, it had 200 entries for each class, for each label. And uh, that's a balanced data set where you kind of have the same amount for each class. You can have a, an imbalanced data set where you can have less of a class and there are ways to, to mitigate that by uh, defining your own features that you want to, to extract. And then, uh, and also specifying, maybe adding context to the data, like, um, I know a good example, uh, for example, trying to identify credit card numbers. And in our case, in Shibulita Catalog, you can say, uh, is there a expiration date column uh, in, in the table you're extracting the samples from, yes, no. And that's adding context around, uh, around the data. Um, okay, machine learning powered SQL prompt suggestions, anyone? <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I guess there is a potential there to, <laughs> to, to use machine learning to maybe observe uh, user behavior and use a regression algorithm to predict what they're trying to achieve. And yes, that's that's probably doable. Uh, Clippy, it looks like you're writing a joint statement. <laughs> yes, it falls into the same into the same area. And random ideas or the opportunities. Okay, yeah. So it seems like we're already identifying opportunities for using uh, for using machine learning in some of the products, which is uh, which is great. Right. So let's see how we use a similar model in. SQL Data Catalog, because that's the product I've been working on. Uh, let's see, I have a window here. Okay, so we have these tables here. Um, for, I guess most people are aware of what SQL Data Catalog is. Uh, it's a tool to, to classify um, uh, uh, columns uh, in, uh, in a database. Um, and in our case, we have a, a rule engine that relies on um, on column names uh, to to give uh, to apply tags uh, mostly automatically, but in this case, the column names don't tell us anything. So at this point, it's best it's it's a great use case for machine learning because we can actually look at the data. So based on the model that we trained previously, this one that I'm going to use was pre-trained because I don't want to mess with the code now and have the demo gods upset. So we're gonna go to our ML test database and we are going to scan for changes. What this is gonna do is it's gonna go and pick up every column in the database, bring in the data from it, or a small sample set from, uh, from the data. And then for each column, put it through the machine learning model uh, put it each sample and then get the one that occurred the most because you can have outliers like a first name that looks maybe a lot like, uh, well, it shouldn't look like an email address, but who knows? It may return email address. But if most of the values are uh, first names, then it's probably first names in the columns and it's a good, good enough confidence. So now that this was scanned, we can go in here and we can see that it spotted uh, some data. Uh, we have a column that contains first names, email addresses, and national insurance numbers. Is that correct? We can have a look into the database and we can see that indeed we have first names, emails, and um, national insurance numbers. But what about the third, the fourth column? The fourth column contains phone numbers. However, our model doesn't know about phone numbers. It was never, it never contained data for phone numbers. So what it did in this case, <laughs> it classified with quite a high confidence that they're first names. And I guess this is one of the downsides of, uh, of machine learning because it's only gonna be as good as your data set. And if it doesn't know about something, it's just gonna be returning what it knows about. <laughs> and in this case, it classified phone numbers as first names. Um, uh, any questions now? 
I went quite fast through all of the stuff. <laughs> okay, we can look at, at a few more um, pitfalls. So as I said, it's as good as um, the training data. Uh, you, in, in many cases, this is the big challenge is um, not only the training data, but at some point you can add more training data, it's still not gonna be accurate. So you need to start defining your features to extract from the data. And as I said previously, to add context to, to the data. And this is, uh, involves a lot of manual manual process, manual labor. Uh, and this is not something that uh, you can automate it uh, with ML.net and you're gonna have to go in and dig down. And it's a good example because we were currently struggling a bit with phone numbers. Um, even when we added it to the data set, we, we've been going around trying to, to create the best data set. But funnily enough, we have it's, it's great when you give it an actual phone number, it identifies it as a phone number, it's perfect. You give it something like Steve and it sees that it's not a phone number. But when you have something in between, like for example, something that starts with plus four, four, and then you have a bunch of garbled text, it says that it's a phone number. <laughs> and we need to identify ways to, to improve the data set, say, okay, this is not a phone number and how can we do that? Well, maybe we could try to look at a phone number shouldn't contain any other characters than maybe spaces, parentheses, and plus. So then that can be added as a categorical column into the data set and train on that. Maybe it will yield better results. We'll see. We're still working on that one. Uh, and yeah, this falls into the edge cases that can generate wrong predictions with very high confidence, as we already saw with, uh, with the first names. And models cannot be edited. Uh, this is a particularly pain point for us because we want to ship this to the customers, but we would really love to be able to train on the customer's data. Like if a customer goes and is happy with the predictions that we've, we've given them, we can pull that sample set and then retrain the model so that it gets better for, they, for their use cases. But we can't really do that without shipping the whole data sets because we need the previous data as well to, to retrain it in a consistent manner. Um, and yes, uh, any other questions? Okay, I think I saw something in the chat. So for things like phone card numbers, is machine learning the right answer that feel like the rules are defined well enough to take more deliberate approach. Yes, that is correct. And that is exactly why we are looking into mixing machine learning with regular expressions and with uh, data dictionaries. And for phone numbers and card numbers, yes, it may be that the regular expressions are actually a better solution. and never use ML for something that can be computed or looked at. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> and can you mix and match ML with deterministic methods like regex to address edge cases? Um, yes, yeah, they, they can be mixed. Can you say a bit more about defining features for training? What does this look like? Okay, so if we look at the code that was generated by um, by um, ML.net, we have the the featureized text method. Uh, this does the the automatic one, but we can append more stuff in here. For um, for example, we can have. ML context transforms text. Um, you can do a normalization of the text or uh, produce hashed word bags. This extracts like individual words from, um, from the text. Um, we can have n-grams. So um, 
yeah, that's that's what I meant by 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 features from from text. Like for example, does it have any spaces in the text, or uh, does it have any digits? Uh, how many how how many words are there in the text? So these are features of uh, of a data point that you can add uh, that you can extract either in the code or you can add them as individual columns into the data set, and then in the model builder you can tell the the model builder that those are uh, additional features is there a concept of model confidence that helps with the phone number approach the model says it's 100% a phone number but it's only a 1% match for the model itself only a 1% match for the model itself. Uh, I don't, what do you mean by 1% match for the model itself? Sorry, I, I messed up the description. So you know how when you, you run the model against that database and it came back saying, oh, phone number is definitely a first name. Yes. But is there, that's its prediction based on what it knows, but does it know how good a fit that data is in general for the model itself? Like, wow, I didn't see anything that looked like that at all whilst I was being trained. So to help you work out if, yeah, this model says it's 100% confident with that this is a first name, but actually it didn't really see any data like that whilst it was being trained. Do you know what I mean? Yes, but I, I think it's because of the features that were extracted from the text. Um, uh, it's a bit of a black box. That's that's another issue with <laughs> with this because you don't know exactly what. I mean, you can load them, you can export the model in and load it into a viewer, and it's gonna show you the the paths that inputs take uh, and how they're processed. But um, uh, Maybe they look very similar to it. I, the, the, because of the features that it extracted, it looked very, very similar. I guess to us, the phone number looks like a phone number because we know what a number is rather than a letter that you get in a name. Whereas if the machine learning model just looks at it as a series of characters, and it's not got a distinction between letters and numbers, then a phone number does look like a name. So if we were looking at identifying differences between letters and numbers as one of our features, would it then be less certain that a phone number is a name because it's not seen any names with numbers in before? But wouldn't there be a macro score, like some sort of macro score for how well it fits the model itself in a way? Because if the model's never seen a string of numbers, it should be able to go, oh, actually, is this something else? I don't know. Yeah, it, it could be. Maybe, maybe maybe my formula is um, is messed up for me. Uh, okay, so what's the status of ML for the SQL Data Catalog? It is is it a POC or production ready version? Uh, so we're currently working on integrating it into the product, um, and because of the issues that we've already spotted we are we are mixing it with uh, data dictionaries and regex and we're currently building a variety of classifiers like where, where we can use uh, regex or data dictionaries we use those and we'll try to use machine learning for more delicate cases but it's still it's a work in progress at the moment we've not shipped anything yet and it's not production ready um, so if we want to ship classifications with the product, we would need to train using multi-language data, special characters, and a lot of varying formats, those codes vary widely. Is that realistic? Y yes, that's, that's correct. It, uh, the data sets needs to need to contain as much variety as possible, but we have to start somewhere. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we're focusing on English speaking countries, US, UK, and English data. For example, we have we do have data sets that contain a variety of names. For example, we have first names and last names from 
many cultures and many many countries in a, in a data set that we already use in data masker so we will be we will be trying to train on that one and uh, and see how how well it goes okay yes tom's right give us another three weeks or so <laughs> we're working on it we're getting there we'll keep you posted with uh, with the updates cool uh this went much faster than i expected uh, any other questions no cool well uh, that was it from me i hope you found this useful and uh, have fun with machine learning <laughs> i think there's one last minute question that ali's just popped up with are there any off-the-shelf models for these kinds of things rather than having to train our own um i've not found a multi-class classification model that can cover all these information types there are various approaches uh, there's one called Sherlock, but that requires Python and that it's a whole implementation, like an entire framework for uh, identifying information types. And then we also, there's also Spacey, uh, which is a natural language processing framework, um, which can identify various data types inside, uh, inside text. Um, but like most of them for most of them the challenge is that you kind of need to dive into python like you, you don't i have we we were not able to find a model that we could easily import into ml.net and use shouldn't we look at using i mean it seems like the right tool for the job is python then rather than net right yeah yeah it it could it may very well be yeah slap it behind a web api and you're all set right mm -hmm. What is <laughs> Starting in 2017, we, SQL Server has a free install of Python sitting in it. Yay! We can you, you can put that in our installer. <laughs> yeah, we we tried a bit with uh, with some uh, with Spacey in, uh, and there's also Catalyst, which wraps uh, Spacey in a .NET stuff. But you still need Python uh, behind the scenes, and it gets very wonky very fast <laughs> when it. It's time to build uh, the whole project. But yes, we, we may have to look into, like one suggestion we received was that we may very well go on the platform and have this as a separate service. <laughs> Ali is happy. <clears throat> so yeah, there, there are ways to, to approach this. We, we try to go with the easy one first, just to see if we can get some, uh, some traction. And if things go well, we can we can very well, very well look at alternatives. Like like I said, writing the code is the easy part here. It's just finding the right model to use, finding the right features, uh, or finding a pre-built solution that works for our use case. That's the difficult part. Another question is coming from Matthew. Are you intending to allow customers to provide their own training data? We would love that. We would really love to be able to train on the customer's data, even if they don't send the improved models back, just to have theirs. Like if they identify a certain data type that maybe we don't have, but they have spread around their database, they could be able to add it. But we can't do that at the moment because like I said, you need to ship the whole data sets and we would end up with very large installs for very little gain. So no, for the first iteration, uh, machine learning is gonna be a pre-trained model for a predefined set of classes. Like we have competitors that do this, but they are already they already provide their service in the cloud, uh, their SaaS, and they can easily have a, a serve another service on the side that pulls their data. And uh, we've actually seen cust cust uh, sorry competitors that actually use customers' data to improve the model for everyone, which is an interesting approach. But I guess that's also a legal nightmare. 
so yeah <laughs> is it useful to train with database metadata in addition column names constraints indexes or does that swap the normal training data uh, yes, that you you could train on that with that, and it it falls into the adding context around the data. Like I said, for example, if you if you're bringing samples from a column, but and you want to check if it's a credit card, you can have the is this sample in a database with a expiration date column? Yes, no, and that can be a feature. Um, it's tricky, but uh, adding context, adding good context to data improves uh, predictions. So yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Let me actually work. Do we have any more questions waiting to come in? <laughs> I'm going to take the silence and the lack of movement in chat as a no. So in that case, thank you very much, Merchant. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming. Lots of, lots of clapping on the cameras. That's really nice to see. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you for joining us for that talk today. Uh, all I think is left is for me to remind you of everything else that we've got on for Level Up Week today, which is actually quite a lot. So bear with me a minute. Um, by being here, you've already chosen not to be with Peter Gerard, who's taking people through creating a React app from scratch, but that does mean that at around about noon, I think, Liam Jones is talking about his experience going from a monolith to event-driven microservices in Azure. So I hope to see a lot of you in that talk later. Got a bit of a break then until two o'clock, then Ben Mancini is gonna be teaching people everything they ever wanted to know about Agile. At three o'clock, you've got a choice. You can join Steve Granshaw, who also works on the governors, talking about their approach to democratizing research. Or if you're looking for something a bit more highfalutin, you can go and listen to Ben Reese talking about how to become an exec at a medium sized software company, something you should know a fair bit about. At four o'clock, we've got actually a nice group of people talking about what they've learned in the establishment of Redgate's customer success department. Oh, and there's more. We've got a set of lightning talks at five o'clock. We've got Neil Turner, Gina Taylor, and Alicia talking about some different topics. Most importantly, some people are making tacos early evening UK time. And we've got some times in our late slot today as well. So at nine o'clock UK time, Lindsay Gattis is going to be talking about the psychology of a proposal. James King is going to be talking about why. And then there's even more taco making for the people that are going to be staying up quite that late for the UK. I think this is the longest day we've got on the calendar this week. So that should be everything. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Hope you have a fantastic day. Join in a lot of those other sessions and enjoy the rest of the week. Have fun, folks. <laughs>